certain areas of the world have seen what can happen to paper money, seen some of the things that can happen politically and regime changes through military. They they understand and what the possession of physical gold means. The silver price and gold price are affected by geopolitics, are affected by tough domestic issues being faced right now in the United States of America. In this part one of two interviews I did with Peter Grandage, we discussed these factors. I hope you enjoy the video. Make sure you come back for part two. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by Mr. Peter Grandich. He has decades of experience on Wall Street and in the financial services industry. Uh, he's an author. He's worked with professional sports athletes. He's appeared on news outlets such as CNBC, uh, he's been in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Business Week, the New York Times. That's just part of what he's done. It's uh, a privilege and an honor for us uh, to be joined by Peter today in the basement. Peter, welcome to Ron's Basement. Well, I'm glad to be here, and it's just as so much an honor for me to speak to you as you feel it is to me. Well, thank you. That's uh, uh, you're, you're, you're one of the one of the things I admire about you is your humility and your honesty. Uh, you know, I know you've been investing for many, many years. Uh, what do you make of the current climate, uh, let's say, in the economy, the overall markets? Any any thoughts you'd like to share with us? Well, I always like to start off with, uh, and that's one of the reasons why my book, which came in its fifth edition, I added the word former Wall Street Whiz Kid, because not after only losing millions once, twice, I really didn't think I should be called a Whiz Kid. But uh, I will tell you that as I approach my 40th year around this, uh, in 2021, I got extremely bearish, not that I was a screaming bull beforehand, to the point where I just saw America renting what I called its worst social, political, and economic era. And uh, in fact, if people wanted to listen, and many didn't, to sell all stocks and bonds, because I really thought bonds were going to lose at least 10% of their value, which they did, and uh, pretty much have stayed that uh, level of bearishness. Now, I'm not in the crash camp. There is a camp out there that thinks the market could still fall 50 or 60 percent. I only think there's one scenario where that can happen, but I do think that markets are going to be extremely challenging for as far as the eye can see. And, and I'll just give you a couple of thoughts. First of all, from the political aspect, we're going to have, if we haven't already witnessed it, the most dysfunctional congressional group ever. Not only do the Republicans and Democrats want absolutely nothing to do with each other and work together, but they actually have fractions within their group that have differences of opinions. So at a time when the United States needs a whole lot of serious stuff done from a fiscal side, I, I just don't see Congress uh, able to uh, come to grips and deal with that. The economics is even worse, Ron. Uh, most people know about the, the deficits and debt you know, it's hard not to, it's hard for me to phantom run. When I started in 1984 as a young whippersnapper, somebody called me the other day, to think that we would ever use the word T to describe anything, debt or deficits. And now we have 31 T's as debt, and we have a, a, a heading towards two T's for, for a deficit. But there are as bad cases, if not worse than that. The one that I'm most concerned about now, because Wall Street spends a lot of time advertising that they're somehow good at it, is what I call the coming retirement crisis. We have about 75% of Americans now working paycheck to paycheck. That's how, how the vast majority of people are struggling. They've also, because of the inflation aspect that hit, they had to resort to credit cards just to pay for necessities. So they're really in no position or have been in a position to save for retirement. And we've seen all sorts of studies where people have little or no money saved for retirement. So that's a future issue that's going to come and approach us while there's other issues. But within that, I think there's going to be an even serious problem. My faith makes me speak this, but I always try to stay secular in these type of interviews. But I have to share this part. I think there's going to be a battle of the ages within that. And what I mean is 
we're going to see younger and younger people still work and be taxed, taxed, and more to pay for the Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, no matter how they readjust it and so forth and so on. And they're going to get very upset that they're getting burdened so much and say, hey, there's an 85-year-old man that Medicare is spending a half a million dollars to give him a heart transplant or a lung transplant. He's old, you know, you know forget that. But the older man is going to also say, wait a minute, I paid in all these years. I want to live. I want to have this. And to know what can happen in that, we only have to look north of the border, Ron. Canada instituted a law two years ago where their health organizations, and of course, it's socialist medicine there, encouraging very older people, even if they're not very sick, but especially the ones that are, that maybe it's come time to just, you know, take your own life and stay as a burden to yourself and of course to us. And if there's any country that's close to us that lives kind of like we do and think like we do, it's Canada. So I, I find that a very atrocious problem. It, Wall Street pays no attention to it. Uh, if the financial advisor even has a depth of understanding what I just shared with you, he or she will not discuss what I just discussed because, quite frankly, I've seen it. I lose potential clients in our planning business when we bring that up because they run down the street to the guy that has the black box and promises, you know, great wealth. And then the last thing is socially, Ron. I think we are seeing a dramatic change than what our parents and grandparents lived through. Like it or not, uh, there was faith played a bigger role in everyday life. 40, 50, 60 years ago. That's being moved out. And of course, those of us who still have that type of fate and want to live that fate are seeing it much more challenging to do and seeing the way people are choosing to live. There's as many people now cloning polls that are atheists or agnostic than there are people that are religious. So there's a whole series of things. And I believe it or not, just touched on the surface view, but those are some of the key things that I think people need to focus on at as far out as the eye can see. We'd like to thank our sponsor, First Mining Gold. They're a Canadian gold developer with two world-class projects in Canada. They also have a handful of other projects. When you total up all the gold in their resources, it comes to over 12 million ounces. They're worth checking out. I'll put a link to the company's website in the description below. Would it be safe to say that there's a there's a confluence of factors that are coming together right now? And as we look back, let's say over the last three decades, four decades, that uh, that that we're we're now likely moving into a period where it's time to pay the piper. Uh, that uh, I heard it said a decade ago, and the saying stuck with me that mathematics shows no forgiveness on the altar of truth, meaning you can only you know, you can only use smoke and mirrors and, and the Fed can only print money for so long. The government can only run deficits for so long. At some point that that, you know, the bill has to be paid. Is that is that a, a fair statement? You mentioned before we began that you had young daughters. They're going to pay a much more dearer price than you will, Ron. Yeah. They, you've had at least some time in your early stage, at least when you were young and your parents you know, when I started in the business in 1984, America was the largest creditor nation. Honestly, if you ever said we had a T of anything, deficit or debt, I would tell you, you're crazy. But we really borrowed heavily against our future. And they'll kick the can one more time. There's, you know, I don't even know why they call it a debt ceiling, Ron. I, they've gone through it 69, <laughs> or 70 times, but they'll get to it and, and you know, in June and, and get through it. But that can has become so heavy that I don't even know if it's, you say you can kick it anymore. They could possibly roll it a little, but we're going to get to the point where they can't kick it anymore. And that's when the the, the, the piper is going to come and you're going to have to pay the piper. Yeah, I, I made a video a, a year ago. I said it started out as a can. It turned into a five gallon bucket. And now it's like, you know, one of those big 55 gallon oil drums that at some point you just can't kick it any any longer uh, um, i can i concur with you completely ron uh let's 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 shift over to precious metals for a second i know and correct me if i'm wrong you're not a permable when it comes to gold and silver however 
do you do you see gold and silver uh, in this current environment? Precious metals in general uh, playing a role as a as a uh, safety mechanism or you know a tool for preservation of wealth. Sure. So I would say for the majority of my time, I've been favorable to gold. But there's been times when I've been out, and it was actually a couple of times I shorted it and mm -hmm. bought it. The, I learned how gold bugs don't like talking to people that are talking about <laughs> shorting gold. But I haven't been that in a while. And I've actually called, I even reemphasized just before we speak on my Twitter page, that I, you know, I've been absolutely convinced that we are in the early stages of a mega gold bull market, which will be the best bull market since I've been in the business and uh, will certainly go to new highs, not nominal highs, but adjusting for inflation. And, and if you like, I can, I can pawn on why I, I think that's the case. Yes, please, please. So there are a whole lot of reasons, but I think there's two critical ones. The first one that's most of that is that central banks have become major buyers of gold. For a lot of years, in the early of my years, you had to fight that. They were sellers. And that's why gold had trouble rising. Central banks who are setting records in what they're buying are not buying it for speculation. They're not buying it for a trade. They're not buying it so they can escape to a cabin in the woods or get buy guns if there's Armageddon. They're buying it for something extremely specific, and there may be multiple reasons. One, I think, is the most obvious. They just want to diversify from the dollar. I think any country that isn't exactly the best of our friends, and we have a lot less friends in the world now politically than we had during our parents' time, they don't want to be stuck like Russia was and be held you know, to the dollar. So I suspect that that's one of the reasons of the diversification. I think another reason is we're going to see certain countries, if not whole groups like BRICS, but at least certain regions of the world where they're going to trade away from the dollar. They're going to institute some other currency or use one that's out there, but gold is going to become part of any new currency that comes out. And the argument would be, hey, Use our thing, it's backed by gold. The United States is backed by 30 something trillion dollars in debt <laughs> and the ability to supposedly pay you. That's going to be the selling point. Yeah. I think that's a tremendous shift. It clearly, if you talk to any of these people that have uh, metals, sell metals for a living, they just see a constant physical buy in of gold. It hasn't stopped. Uh, the other reason, and a reason that used to, in a sense, suppress it was, for the most part, gold had traded in both in London and what I call the Crimex, which is known as the Comex. And uh, there was just historically just a lot of bad trading, manipulation, <clears throat> false orders. And we saw people charged and some convicted. But since gold has moved more and more to the Far East trading, the paper market, we don't see that as much. It's not that it goes away, but there's gold bugs that every time gold falls, oh, it's manipulation. No, sometimes it's just more sellers than buyers, but that helped take away and it's allowed the physical market to become more representative of the true price versus the paper. But there's one caveat for United, for, for those of us of us Americans. The financial service in the United States treats gold like kryptonite. <laughs> they don't want to be anywhere near it. They advise you not to be. And the terrible thing about that is, for the very least reason, someone should owe gold and hope it doesn't go up. Now, I tell that to people and go, why do you want me to buy something that you're hoping not goes up? Well, you probably have most of your assets in some sort of financial asset, stocks, bonds, 401k, et cetera. Trust me, if gold goes up a lot, Chances are your financial assets have fallen. So treat it like an insurance policy. Most people have home insurance, don't want it to burn. Most people have car insurance, don't want to have an accident. Yeah. That's the minimum. But I think now, Ron, it offers very attractive capital appreciation opportunity, whether just purchasing the physical or things related to gold, most likely you know things like mining shares and all. And then diversing the base metals actually have as good, if not a better promising outlook than gold does right now. Including copper. Yeah. Uh, 
I found it interesting, and I've heard different reports on this regarding uh, the 2022 uh, amount of gold that was purchased by the central banks. I've, I've, I've heard one report that said it was an all-time record. I've heard another report said the most since 1950. And then uh, even another report that said the most since 1967. But I think what, what, what really rang true for me on that situation was the fact that last year was the most gold mine or most gold buying by central banks. At minimum, those previous years where it was even as close to as much, we were on the gold standard. So right. what does that tell me? You know what? I mean, obviously I'm not saying we're on the gold standard now, but the fact that these banks are buying that much gold uh, and the last time they did, we were on the gold standard. To me, that uh, at minimum tells me that there's there's something going on with the world central banks and the way they view gold. So, Ron, if you think about that flip, and you're right, before Nixon got rid of the gold standard and that opened the door for deficits, because before that you really couldn't have deficits. Right. Uh, it was the reverse of what it is now. It's about, I think, seven or eight percent central banks have a percentage wise of gold. And they have close to si somewhere between 60 something and 70 something percent in dollars. It was the flip of that before they did, wow. well, did that. And so if we're right about their views of the dollar and all the political stuff, I mean, even today, before you and I spoke, there's stories running that Saudi and, and, Iran, and Iran is getting back together. They're going to bash it as an all. And I, I make a joke, please, Biden, don't go over there again. They'll actually won't send us anything anymore if you go over there. But but there is a clear movement, the BRIC nations, and even some people that still say we're allies, but aren't exactly the best of friends. Uh, you could see them wanting to get more diversified away from the dollar. And uh, what else are you going to go to? You know, yeah. there's no other currency that you can go. I mean, the dollar really has risen for a couple of reasons. Right now to the world, it looks like the least of worst evils. And it's the world reserve currency. But that that could be lost too down the road. But then there's the geopolitical concerns, and anybody had seen what we did first about how we left Afghanistan and basically left our allies there to fend for themselves. But more importantly, what we've done with Russia. So if you're not the best of our friends, which you can really count on your hands now, just uh, what we call really great allies. I can see them why why they want to see get more diversified into gold. Yeah, I, I've, I have a question for you, uh, and, and it's based on something you said a little bit earlier. So I have this uh, YouTube channel. I focus on gold and silver, and I have a lot of viewers from all over the world. What I sense is that outside of the United States, generally speaking, people have a much greater appreciation for silver and gold. My viewers, even in Europe and Germany and Holland, um, and I feel like in the United States that, uh, that, that, that people like myself who are, I guess I'll say enthusiasts or gold, silver bugs, however you want to say it, that were a, a real small minority. This is a two-part question. Do you think that part of the reason behind that is because, you know, in 1933, Roosevelt um, made it illegal for Americans to own gold. That lasted up until, what, 1974. And then, obviously, in 71, Nixon took us off the gold standard. And some people think then there was a, you know, gold was treated as kryptonite to the dollar. Do you think that uh, that that that's the reason why so few Americans uh, and, and I guess the second part of the question and maybe this relates to the answer is why does the financial services industry treat gold like kryptonite? So I'll answer the second one first because they can't okay. make a lot of money selling it and it's okay. not something they're going to be able to turn around and collect a lot of fees and switch into a lot of things. That's the God, that's my God's honest truth, whether that's the fact or not, but that's my answer. The other answer is we can go into any financial service firm office in anywhere in the United States and be able to look at all their accounts and go back to last year, the last three years or five years. And I would say not one tenth of 1% of those accounts have any exposure to gold. Yeah. And the reason is, as I told you, the financial service industry, ask 
it made me meet some of the people that have gone through these programs that the brokerage firms have, and they brought in new guys and gals, and they just started now. And ask them in any time when you were training to become the advisor, did they ever bring up about gold is a good reason? I've never heard of that, you know. So there's also another part that plays around, and it's interesting you talk about certain areas of the world. Certain areas of the world have seen what can happen to paper money, seen some of the things that can happen politically and regime changes through military. They've, they understand and what the possession of physical gold means. Americans up until now have lived, you know, for almost 40 years on a Kool-Aid <laughs> lifestyle. I mean, we've been living beyond our means. My poster child for that, just so you know, is, and there's nothing wrong with this industry, but I call it the poster child for what's wrong with America is you can't drive down any major highway in any state and not within a couple of miles see a public storage facility. Now, they weren't around around when our parents and grandparents were, and our parents didn't have four and 5,000 square foot homes to keep stuff in. We lived in much smaller dwellings. America has too much stuff. It's caught up in stuff. And it doesn't think of. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Just take one look around my basement here, Peter. That's uh, case in point. Sorry, I interrupted you. Well, I, you know, it, it, it's okay. You know, I'm talking about stuff that, you know, not necessities or even German, just just too much. That doesn't mean everybody in public storage is there because businesses use that to keep stuff there and people moving in between. But George Carlin used to have a great. Uh, an act about that, about about the stuff. And that's really one of the reasons also. We've gotten caught up and we've, but debt became a way of life in America. You know, you can't turn on a TV show and not sooner or later see somebody coming on, hey, you can save 5% using this credit card. You get 5% back. They don't talk about the 95% that you spent and maybe probably for something you didn't actually need. But that's <laughs> I'll just say this, Ron, in my planning business, seven out of 10 people, even when you talked about when I dealt with athletes, it doesn't matter what level of income, they all live at least one financial level above where they really should. They're extended in some way. They either have two bigger car leases sitting out in the front where they could have got a small car and own it, but they decide to get you know some luxury car. They have a, a boat or whatever, but they still paying the mortgage draw off and they have paying off the minimum on their credit cards. Our parents, mine didn't, they never had a credit card. The difference now is Ron, parents said, can we afford it? Younger people now say, can we make the first payment? Right. And that's really the big change. And, and, and so that goes into all about why would I want to own gold? Because it's happy days are here again. I, I call the vast majority of people in the financial service industry the don't worry, be happy crowd. And one of the main reasons I do is, I, I literally say this all the time, Ron, you could toss them off the Empire State Building all the way down, they all will say the same thing. Hey, so far, so good. And and that's that's been basically it for almost 40 years now, Ron. We had a couple of big hiccups. We had some crashes and things, but nobody's had to go any real length of time and not see it come back. In fact, that don't worry, be happy crowd has been telling their clients since the start of this year, hey, last year was a fluke. It always comes back. Problem is they all learned how to drive on a one-way street, Ron. Mm -hmm. And anybody that took driver's ed or when your parents taught you to teach, when you first had to face traffic the other way or go off a bit of traffic circle, you were lost. Because, Well, they're at a traffic circle now. And that's that's going to be the issue when you asked before about could there be a crash? My one caveat for a crash is this, Ron. If we go and get towards the end of this year and we're down some again, I don't see the public that held through last year holding again. Because think about this. Fidelity says their average retirement account was down 25% last year. Wow. Inflation has been double digit. Now, we could argue I think it's a lot more than what the government tells us. But let's just say over two years, it was 15% total. So seven and a half percent each year. They're going to be looking basically having 40% less worth than they did just two years ago. I don't think they're going to listen about just hold on, Mr. and Mrs. America. I think they're going to somewhat panic or definitely want to leave that person or group or whatever. And that's where I think come the end of this year, 
if we haven't seen at least a little tick up in the market from last year, that's where we can see a real sharp sell off. Interesting. Interesting. I like uh, I like that point you brought up that, you know, last year, yeah, we had some, you know, general uh, downturn in the market down 20 percent, down 20, whatever the Nasdaq was down 25 percent. But if you factor in inflation, the, the losses were really significantly more uh, in, in real terms. And uh, one other point, Ron, I think you from what I've seen about you and you're thinking and I've watched your videos. The other thing about that is I live in a 55 and over community. About half the people here are retired. So in the last several months when they've seen me, they'll ask me about a certain company. I don't have to name it. We'll call it XYZ. And they'll go, Pete, it's down 20, 25%. I'm not worried about that, but I'm living off the dividend. Do you think they can cut the dividend? And the problem is what the Fed did by killing the fixed income market. They killed it. When they drove interest rates down to zero, they made everybody look elsewhere. I mean, there's people that bought packaged car loans of high risk people. I know some people that have them here. There's a whole the REITs. They went very much into the REITs for the, the yield because most of these people retired and they had to, all they had going for them was to earn interest on their principal. But in the old days, if you didn't like the stock market, you switched to bonds or Ginnie Mays or CDs, you know, 6% or something. That all changed. So those people are very, very weak holders. If there's more of a downdraft, or we see a real hard recession and companies have to start cut, cutting dividends, then we're going to see a, 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 we're going to see things a lot worse from, from a lot more people. And then who knows what what they decide to do. And, and what do you think about? I'm hearing more and more of this. You know, if those people are holding these dividend stocks that maybe have a four percent or five percent dividend yield, why wouldn't they be enticed to switch that over to a two year treasury? note that is paying if, if i have it correctly about the same amount with do you, yeah. do you, do you sorry, see that Ron. do you yeah, see that I, being a risk and i'm playing just yes uh yesterday or the day before i said for the first time since i said about bond market the two year now at five percent is great competition especially when the s p 500 dividend yield was around just one and a half percent hey you know what the way things are going and all and you get the argument, okay, the stock market averaged 9% over 100 years or whatever. Safe than sorry. And just just sit there yeah. until we get a better idea of, of what things you know are going to be and so forth. But still, the younger they are, the less likely they want to do that. There's still this, there's mm -hmm. still folks on there saying crypto uh, Bitcoin's going <laughs> to a million, you know, even right. though Ron. People were destroyed in the cryptocurrency market. Yeah. I don't mean loss. It wasn't like a bad thing. Even when the tech bubble bust, it was nothing like hundreds, if not thousands of these coins and that people went in and people lost everything. And what drove me crazy about it, and I I went on things like Kitco and all. And boy, when I said at 60 something thousand, I never had commented about Bitcoin. I called it the tulip mania of the 21st century. Right. I got a death threat. And not only did I get a lot of bet, and people were so intertwined and betting everything. And they had these, no offense, but they had 21, 22-year-old person appearing on, you call it CNBC, I call it Tau TV. And they wheel him out. They tell how great he did. They named the coin. And he expunged on all the reasons why you can make money. And I was saying, hey, wait a second. The toughest thing this young man ever had to deal with up until now was algebra class a couple of years ago in high school. <laughs> I don't know if you want to bet your whole financial future on him. And that was a tremendous loss of money. And it's gone. It's not like it's down low and it can come back and all. And in a sense, and if you switch back to gold, it probably took some of the buying power that would have normally gone into gold or something like that as a real hedge. When these guys like this one man that's out there, and I'll say his name, Michael Saylor, how could you tell everybody, anybody in any shape or form to sell everything, borrow if you have to, and put it all in one of a sector, not the whole sector, just one. And he still does it today. And he's still people that have a man like that on. And if you would have done that during the penny stock era or the internet bubble era, you would have been sued and fined and maybe even in jail now. So there's a 
there's still a lot of damage out there. That's why I say I just don't see how the stock market can go up dramatically or in the way that it used to for as far out as the eye can see. Yeah.